Welcome to the house of the Lord. It's always great when his people gather together to praise, to worship, to receive, to bless others. So welcome here this morning. My name's Sarah, for those of you who I haven't met. Uh, I just want to start by reading a scripture for you this morning. Psalms 40, verses 2 to 4 says, He lifted me out of the grave. He lifted me from that muddy place. He picked me up, put me on solid ground and kept my feet from slipping. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see what he did and worship him. They will put their trust in the Lord. Great blessings belong to those who trust in the Lord. That's my prayer for us this morning that wherever we are in life, whatever's happening, whatever circumstances or situations we find ourselves in, we can have great trust and faith in our God who is faithful. Amen. So let's stand. It is a glorious day. So let's praise God together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures, I tried to hide. It was my turn.
Let everything Let everything that has breath, that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything Let everything that has breath, that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise Praise when I'm short and I praise when I'm down. I praise when I'm numbered. I praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a Once again, welcome uh, to Kerry. Great to be together to celebrate our Lord and to worship Him this morning. So a uh, couple of things to share with you. They're not new if you've been around, but we're really excited about them. Next week, we start our Alpha series. So as the term gets started next Sunday for Alpha, can anybody tell me, I don't know if it's up there, can anybody tell me what time to arrive next week? Nine. Why? Because breakfast exactly will be served. So we'd love to see you here. We're going to have some breakfast. Now, a lot of people have asked me, what is for brekkie? Uh, and I'm going to tell you, come along and find out. Uh, and so hopefully it'll be some things that you really like. We'll have a range of options. And uh, the idea is come along, enjoy some food together as a way of beginning what's going to be a different time of community and fellowship as we do the Alpha course. Uh, at about 9.30... 
we will start our service and within the service we will do this alpha course and we've been telling you uh, if you're not familiar with the alpha course go along to alpha.org or alpha.org au and uh, find out a little more it's a course that's been running for many years millions of people have done it and many many people have come to know jesus if you already know Jesus, and if you've already done the Alpha course, it's still worthwhile coming along because we get to explore questions of life together, and I bet you've still got some of those. Also, you'll be able to help people who perhaps have more questions than you learn more as well. Now, on that note, today at 11 o'clock, so after the service, after you've grabbed some morning tea, we're actually going to run a a little sort of training so that we can get familiar with Alpha. It'll explore a little bit more about what Alpha is and talk about how we're going to interact on the tables because we won't be sitting in rows, we'll be sitting in tables together. So if you are able to stay and if you would like to, uh, from about 11 till 12 in the auditorium here, just gather near the front and uh, we'll just talk about that um, and love to have you at that if you're able to. So Alpha, can't wait, looking forward to that over the course of the term. In the middle of the term, we have our church camp, and we are really looking forward to that, doing that together as well. It's the first time for a long time that we're actually uh, hoping to have many of us all together. Uh, together. Now, it'll be down at Serpentine. It runs for the long week end at, right at the start of June, and all the details are on the web. We'd love for you to sign up for that. Please, registrations are open, and once you register, you'll then get an email uh, to, to give you a bit more detail. So we'd love to have you along for that, if it's at all possible. If cost is a concern or an issue, we have discounts available. You don't have to qualify for that. Just grab those discounts, 25% or 50%, because we really want you to be able to join us on, uh, on that camp together. At the camp, we will be covering some alpha material, but it will also work standalone. So if you hadn't attended any of the Alpha before that, camp will still work and it'll be a great time. Uh, and so we just encourage you to sign up and come along with your family. Wonderful. All right, so that is Alpha and that's the camp. What I would really love to do this morning is to pray about Alpha together uh, because it's an opportunity for us to be inviting friends, neighbours, anybody to come along. Alpha's designed to be something that's a really... Um, easy, fun way to engage with the questions of life, including questions about God and who Jesus is. So we'd love for you to invite people. You may have seen these before. You might, like me, carry one with you. This is a little card that you can give to people and say, hey, Alpha's being run at our church. We'd love for you to come along. Here are all the details. We've got tons of these cards. They're down the back. Uh, if you were here, I think at Easter, we had them for our Easter service. So grab some of those cards, carry them with you and hand them out to people. But let's pray. Now, what I'd like to do is invite you to pray. Uh, and so what I'll do, I'm going to suggest to you what to be praying for around Alpha, and then just give you a couple of minutes to be praying. You can play, pray in little groups, you can pray by yourself, whatever feels comfortable to you. And what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd give it to us in sections so that together we'll be praying for all these things. But I'm going to invite this section of the congregation to be praying about these things. First of all, for the preparation and planning, all the logistics of doing something quite different, including breakfast, including tables, etc. If you could pray for that, that would be wonderful, as well as the invitations. So just pray for the, the invitations that many will make and that those people would be open to coming along. So that's for you guys. For you guys here in the centre, love for you to be praying about the spiritual preparation in each of our hearts but also across us as a community for those who will come who may not know Jesus yet if you could be praying for that and also for the movement of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit to be in is already in us to be working in us and amongst us as we go through this process and over on this side can I invite you to be praying for two things uh, unity and fellowship as we do this. So one of the reasons that we're doing Alpha together is to increase the connection across the congregation. And as we sit in tables and spend time actually talking rather than just listening, it's a great opportunity for connection and fellowship and unity. So if you could pray for that for all of us, um, as well as transformation and life change. 
uh, in my experience, personal experience, and the experience of many people, uh, the way that Alpha runs things allows God to step into people's lives and change them significantly. So can you be praying for that? And online, don't want to forget you. I've got one bullet point for you. If you could be praying for our broader community, perhaps including online, because yes, we will be uh, doing the best we can to do these services online for you. And so if you could be praying for the impact across the community, including the online community of the Alpha Course. So let me give you just a couple of minutes then to pray with the person next to you or in small groups or just by yourself. But let's bring those things before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we bring this time before you over the coming weeks as we, as a congregation, step into the process of, of the Alpha Course. Father, thank you that you invite us to ask questions of you. Thank you that you give us answers as we need them and in your time and according to your uh, will. And so, Father, we pray that as we come and over these weeks explore what is the meaning of life according to you as we explore who Jesus is. Some of these questions that perhaps we think are basic help us to go deeper into you. Lord, for those of us who have been around for a long time or maybe have done the Alpha course a number of times, would you give us a heart, both that is open to new things you might do and say, but also to leading and loving others who need to hear things. Father, we just thank you that as we are open to you being at work, we get to see more of you at work and grow as your followers and your disciples. And Lord, we pray for this entire community together. Thank you for something new, for something fresh and different. Would you grow us together in that, grow our fellowship, our connection, our unity, all through your Holy Spirit that you have sent. So Father, we look forward to what you're going to do and we praise you your name. May what we do over these coming weeks bring you glory. Amen. Thank you for praying with us. Would you stand with us now as we move into another song?
trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this morning, we just praise your name because you are worthy of all praise. Father God, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from you this morning, to hear your word, 
We invite your spirit to move in us, to speak to us, to transform us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat, church. Today's reading is from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks, Helen, and welcome to you. My name's Brian Harris. If you don't know me, I serve as a pastor at large here. So it's back in the 1990s, and I'm pastor of Amschlonga Baptist Church. And uh, any of you from South Africa, and I think there are a reasonable number of South Africans here, would know that Amschlonga is this beautiful kind of coastal uh, area that's just on the outskirts of Durban. And uh, there's the ocean over here, and then the land kind of slopes up, and the church was on a slope there, and a uh, beautiful, beautiful church, and as you sat in it, kind of you looked towards the front, and there was a wall and the pulpit and everything like that, and then as you turned your head to the right, uh, just you could see these, th this magnificent ocean view, uh, really, really lovely. And... Um, very popular church, so very popular for weddings, popular for funerals. I'm not sure popular by the corpses, but nevertheless popular for funerals. Uh, and uh, you could understand why. It was glorious. But from a preaching point of view, like there was just this little tension. Because I'd be preaching on a Sunday, and the nice thing about here is like if you turn your head anywhere, you just see darkness. It's hardly inspiring, is it? But in Amschlanga... Like, I'd be speaking and preaching my heart out, and after a while, you'd kind of see the heads turning to the right, and they'd be looking out to the ocean, and you'd see this kind of glazed look of happiness and joy come into people's eyes. And I'd think, that's not what's supposed to be happening, and I'd think, you know, how do I win your attention back? And uh, I can remember at a, at a deacon's meeting kind of saying, you know, it is lovely that we have this glorious view, but it does have a bit of a downside. And, you know, that is that it's actually quite a hard gig as a preacher to hold people's attention when there's this competing view uh, off to the right. And uh, they weren't for it at all. I mean, the deacons weren't like, we're not going to put curtains in, thank you very much. We're not going to block that out, thank you very much. Uh, and they, in fact, one of them said, uh, very interesting, yeah, but Brian, don't forget the two books of God, the two books of God, the book of nature and the book of the Bible. So when people come here, 
They listen to you for a while, the book of the Bible, and then they look out the window, the book of, the, 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 the book of nature. It's a very good, very good rounded experience. And in fact, in saying that, they were saying what theologians have often said, that we do have two books. There's the book of God and there's the book of nature. And we should pay attention to both of them. And uh, if you want any kind of background for that, well, Psalm 19 gives it to you because it says, the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Now, I want you to notice what the psalmist is saying there. He's saying that day after day, the skies pour forth their praise for God. Like it's, it's not just a one-off. It's like every day we see something new and fresh from God. And I guess if you think about it, that's part of the challenge, isn't it? Because we take for granted and we don't really appreciate the familiar after a while. Let me explain what I mean. So uh, our family was in New Zealand for nine years, and I was pastor of Mount Roscoe Baptist Church then. Nine, nine very lovely years. And uh, New Zealand is just such a lovely country, isn't it? It's just absolutely gorgeous. If you've never been for holiday there, you don't know what, you, what, what, what you're missing. But recently, just before Easter, I had to go and do some work there. And uh, I was there just for a very short period of time. Uh, and arrived there at, I think it was about 11 o'clock at night, went to the hotel, kind of just crashed down to bed, and then had to get up at 7 in the morning. And 7 in the morning might sound a very respectable time, but when you've just come from Perth, and this was daylight savings time, there was a five-hour time difference. So for me, like I get up at 7, and it feels like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm feeling like I've been hit by a brick, and like not enthusiastic about the day at all, because it just feels like the wrong time altogether. And I knew all the theory about how do you survive, like when you're in a new area and you're in a different time zone, well, you've got to expose yourself to as much light as possible. So I switched on all, all the lights, and then I kind of open up the curtains, and I'm going there, and like, oh, life is terrible, life is so heavy, life is so difficult. And, and then, oh my goodness, I look through the window, and I, I'm just stunned for a moment. Because there outside, and I was on the fifth floor of the hotel, but as you looked out, there was just the greenest of green grass. Like, I mean, New Zealand has green, like you just don't know. And then, like the ocean, like, like there was a section of, of, of water that you looked over, and then the beautiful Waitakere Ranges in the distance. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've forgotten how glorious this is. And, and like in that moment, I just forgot that I felt like washed out and exhausted and everything else, felt invigorated all over again. It was like, a, you know, the heavens declared the glory of God and, and, and could see it and could feel that absolutely. But then I thought back to, to coming to Perth and, and I remembered that like the first time I came to Perth, I looked at the sky and I thought, oh my goodness, that's so blue and so rich and so amazing. Because New Zealand has beautiful, beautiful scenery, but it does actually have gray skies. And that's because it actually rains so much, which is why the grass is so green. So there's a, like, there's a price tag for everything in life, isn't there? So kind of grayish skies, but Perth skies, just beautifully blue. And I remember back to when like, I had just accepted the call to come to, to head up the theological college here, here, here in Perth. And John Ollie, uh, who's part of our congregation and been the previous principal, he was taking me on a, on, on a lift. To, I'd had a speaking engagement at Lake Jundlup uh, Baptist Church. And uh, we were driving along the freeway. And it was the first time I'd been there. And like we were on this freeway. And you come to the Canning Bridge and you see like, the intersection of the Canning River and the Swan River. And do you know how the freeway goes along there? And do you take that for granted? Like, it's a magnificent, magnificent vista, isn't it? Just so extraordinarily beautiful. And I can remember the first time I saw that, just thinking, this is just such an amazing place. And, and God is so, so amazing that this beauty is everywhere. And we probably don't notice that now. But what the psalmist says is, remember that every day 
the heavens are declaring the goodness of God. And there is the first book of God. And in fact, if you, if you read Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 says basically, you know, people who say there are no God are without excuse because there is so much that's out there. There's so much evidence there of the goodness and the might and the glory and, and just the power of God. And we are supposed to, to listen to what, what the psalmist says is the voice of God coming to us through creation. And so we live in a big city. And I think the first thing I'm wanting to say, say, say to you today is like, are you getting out into the first book of God? Are you spending enough time there? You know, sometimes we say, how will we reach our neighbors and friends? And, and great, Alpha is a wonderful, wonderful way to do that. But sometimes an invitation like that is too difficult unless we've done what, what missiologists would call a little bit of pre-evangelism. Like if you thought maybe before you invite your neighbors to church, why not invite them camping together and to go out into the first book of God and to find a moment to have a, like a wow. In New Zealand, we ran a little, what we'd call a pre-evangelistic campaign once. So, so pre-evangelism means that you, like, like you don't dive in and you don't tell people all about Jesus, but you're just softening people up and saying, think a little bit differently. And, and in that campaign, they had just this series of stunning photographs from New Zealand, very beautiful ones. And then there were just the words, don't you wish you had someone to thank? Don't you wish you had someone to thank? And, and it was supposed to just like plant this little seed. Maybe you do have someone to thank. Maybe this isn't all accidentally here. Maybe you should be asking bigger questions. Maybe there is a much bigger, bigger story, the story of God. And, and like when you go into nature and if you're with friends, like remember the heavens declare the glory of God. They have no speech, but they are speaking the whole time. And let them speak to you. And right. Theologians have always recognized this. Augustine spoke of, of nature as God's first book to us, a book we must explore and a book which we must listen to. And you may say, okay, so we say everything is beautiful. What about those times when nature seems kind of deviant? Because we do have those moments, don't we, where, where nature seems deviant and there's tsunamis and there are floods and there are all kinds of terrible things. And you know, I can't explain all of that to you. But I do remember the words of, of another theologian, Rudolf Otto. And Rudolf Otto basically says, like, like when you stand before God, remember that you stand before the mysterium tremendum. Like, like that's the word he uses, the mysterium tremendum. God is the mysterium tremendum. The, the majesty beyond all majesties. The mystery beyond all mysteries that we can never perfectly fathom or understand. And I think that the first book of nature reminds us of that. So is nature wonderful? Yes. Is it beautiful? Yes. Is it sometimes terrifying? Yes. Is God wonderful? Is God beautiful? Is God sometimes terrifying? The answer to all is yes, yes. And when you stand before the greatness and the majesty of creation, you're reminded actually who am I? And what am I? And what is my place in this extraordinary universe? Like the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they are speaking to us. They also give us lots of parables. Like, like if the heavens have speech, what have they been saying to you lately? It's an odd kind of question. Like, like you said, they have no speech, and yet they do talk to us. So, so serious question. Like what have you learned about God from being in God's first book lately. And I'd encourage you to think about your answer to that question. Because actually God does speak to us through his first book. And there are parables that take place every day. Let me give you an example. So I'm a 19 year old, so this goes back a long time. I'm 19 years old. I have gone to a discipleship course that's gonna last for three weeks. And it's a huge step forward in my spiritual journey. 
And in this discipleship course, we get told that uh, we've got to have a day that's set aside for prayer and fasting and total silence. Now, as a 19-year-old extrovert, the thought of a day of complete silence just felt like this is going to be the day from hell, thank you very much. And as a 19-year-old, a day without food, another day from hell, thank you very much. But we are told this will be for our spiritual enrichment. And so I go into the day, and like we're not allowed to speak to anyone. We're supposed to be just reading scripture, contemplating on it, and praying together. And we're in these beautiful grounds, though, like this campsite, retreat site that we've gone to. And it has a little chapel in it. And so I go into the chapel and think, well, maybe I'll be able to pray to God, and I'll read some, some Bible here. And I start doing that. Just as I'm starting to do that, there's like this, this wretched fly comes into the place. And it's one of these buzzy flies. Bzz, 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 bzz. And, and like when you're in total silence and you're trying to really connect with God, and this impertinent fly is there, like it was just very off putting. And I thought, well, I better try and catch it because I'll never be able to concentrate and focus like while it's all around. But it, I, I didn't succeed. Like sometimes flies are just too agile and they were too quick and I couldn't get it. But it seemed as though the fly kind of disliked me as much as I disliked it. Because there was a window there, and the fly was keeping on flying into it. Boom, like it would, would fly, and it would kind of rush to the window and smash in the window. And like the window didn't open. It was one of those windows that didn't open. But the fly seemed to be convinced that that was the way to freedom. And it didn't matter how often it bashed into it. It didn't, didn't learn the lesson. There's no way out through there. Thank you very much. But what it was doing, it was it was becoming more and more determined that this was the pathway out. And so it runs up to the window, we're, we're progressively longer, and would fly from further and further distances to the window, and then boom, smash, boom, smash. And then once, I kid you not, there was actually a door behind the window. It went so far back that it actually went out the chapel altogether. And I thought, at last, it's gone. It's flown away. Not a word of it. It came straight back and like, being outside, but then came, boom, straight back in for the window. At that point, it kind of bashed itself so hard that it was stunned for a moment. I managed to get it to dispatch from this planet. Uh, and I sat there with the corpse of the fly next to me, um, looking at it, thinking, oh, no, I've got to get back. I'm so hungry. And I'm, I'm not interested in eating that, though, thank you. Uh, and I've got to get back into prayer, and I've got to be trying to think great things about God. And, and at that point, I just heard, like, it felt like God just said to me. Now, now I was a 19-year-old, and I was a fairly discontented 9-year-old, 19-year-old. And I was not particularly happy with the number of things that were happening, and I felt I was, like, I just wasn't sure of it. And God said to me, you know what that fly did? It was convinced that the route to happiness was outside that window. And in trying to get there, it actually flew all the way to the outside, got there, and didn't even realize what it had had. It was wanting to get out, and it didn't notice it because it was so set on a fixed idea that it actually had. And God said, and you doing that as well. Like you're discontent because you have so many set ideas about what you should be doing and what life should be giving to you and you are completely wrong. Like you are in exactly the right place at the moment. Learn to be content, learn gratitude. Like there you go, 19 year old. That was the book of nature speaking to me. I've been reading all these amazing Bible passages, but it was seeing that little observation of nature that opened the door to hear a word, a word that I've tried to hold on to all my life. Like, remember the importance of gratitude. Remember, sometimes you think that happiness is out there, but actually, in the search of happiness, you've sometimes got it already. Remember to say thank you to God. The heavens declare the glory of God. And day by day, there are parables that are coming to you. Now, now I teach preaching, amongst other things that I teach, and, and often I say to students, like, like, when you're preaching, you need to tell people stories because they relate to stories. And don't get your stories from books. Get your stories from life. And think about your own life. And then I go into an exercise with them, and I say, so think about the last 24 hours of your life. And you have to think up three stories from your life in the last 24 hours that teach you something about God. And they look at me in blank amazement. They say, I'm not going to be able to do that. And I say, you've got 20 minutes. And at the end of the 20 minutes, you have to have three stories. And you know what? Every single time they do. And 
here's the thing. You may not be in my preaching class, but if you did that exercise and thought about it, you would come up with a three as well. And I want to encourage you to do that, to pause and to say, I've been living my life and I'm living my life in the world that God has made. And there are parables everywhere. What am I hearing? What is God saying to me? What might I otherwise just miss unless I pause for a moment and say, God, you are here. What is your word to me? The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Now, the, the striking thing about the psalm is, of course, that it's not just the book of God, the, 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 the book of nature it speaks about. It then goes on to the book of God, the scriptures. And it says to us, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the law are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant. The fear of the Lord is pure. Now, now it's important that the psalmist doesn't just say, the book of nature is everything. He says, how blessed are we? We have the book of nature, and then we have the book of God, which is given to us. Now, 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 let's think about that for a moment. So this psalm, Psalm 19, when is it written? Who's it written by? It's written by David. Uh, when is it written? Well, David operates around about the year 1000 BC. So it's an old psalm written roughly 3000 years ago. And in, and in it, David like extols the beauty of nature and the beauty of creation and the beauty of everything that is. But then he gets back to the scriptures. And for David, what were the scriptures? I mean, he didn't have the Bible that we had, <laughs> have. I mean, he didn't have, like, the New Testament. And in fact, most of the Old Testament also wasn't written. So if, you, if you're fairly technical about it and you know something of the history of the, the production of the canon, the canon of scripture, it would have been almost certainly the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, first five books of the Bible that David would have had. And as David writes, he just says, this law is beautiful and it's perfect and it makes the simple wise, and I love it. And, and he's right, and it's absolutely true. But what I'm wanting to say to us is, you know what? You don't just have the first five books, and I don't just have the first five books. We've got the 66 books of God. And that's to put us in so much of a stronger position. Like we have the book of nature, and we have the 66 books of the Bible. And David, who is king, like says, I look at them, and one of the books he would have had would have been Exodus. And so he would have had the law of Exodus. He would have had Exodus chapter 20. He would have had the Ten Commandments. And as king, he would have thought, yes, uh, I must think about these. How do we structure our society? No lying, no, 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 no stealing, no murder, no covetousness, no adultery. And, and he says, these guide me. As a simple man, not knowing how to tell people where they should be going, I'm so grateful that I have the book of the law. And though a simple man, it makes me wise. You know, that remains true for us today. And you might often find yourself in situations where you feel, I don't know how to act, and it's beyond me, and it's too complex. The law of the Lord is perfect. Are you diving into it? Do you let it give you the wisdom that it can actually give to you? Take that absolutely seriously. Because we learn deeply and richly about God. And as you pause, why not think about a two-phase kind of spiritual development program for yourself. And I'm really committed to seeing all of us as a, as a church and as a congregation really draw closer to God. Imagine how it would be if you spotted the three parables that you get just as life goes on and, and in nature every day. What would, what would that look like? And what would it be if you started each day by just consuming a little of the law of the Lord, which is perfect, but not just the first five books. Like you take some time from the 66 books and you let them sink deeply into you and you let them nurture you and you let them grow you. And how about at the start of the day, you chew over some scripture and then at the end of the day, you say, and how did that work out in life? Like, we are blessed indeed that we have both these books available to us. Now, now, David gets to the end of his psalm, and he's been thinking like the first book of nature and all the things that we get taught there. 
And then he moves on to the word of the Lord. And then he says, but what about my response? And he prays just this famous and amazing prayer. May the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. It's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? God, I pray that as I have these two books available to me, I pray that the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your hearing. No, may be acceptable in your sight. Now, you may say, that's a little bit odd. Surely, like the words of my lips, these are things that you will hear. But, we, but David says, no, actually, it will be lived out in your sight, O God. In other words, the test of my response to the two books is not primarily in my words, as in blah, 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 I talk and talk and talk, but in what you see in my life, my living should be changed. And so David's prayers, I pray, God, that having seen the book of nature and having seen the book of God, the word of God, and having meditated on both of them, I pray that how I act will be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are my rock and my redeemer. And did you notice that? He closes with, closes with an image from each of those books. Because his image of, O oh Lord, you are my rock, comes from where? The book of nature. Like he looks at it and he says, that's what God is like. He's like a, like a rock for me and he keeps me steady. But God, you are also my redeemer. That's from the book of the Bible which tells the story of God's incredible grace and forgiveness. And David, who knew the law of the Lord, knew that he needed a redeemer. I mean, he tried to teach and run a society on the basis of the Ten Commandments, but my, he broke them himself. He committed adultery, he committed murder, was often covetous. And yet he goes on and says, but I have discovered that in spite of all that takes place, God is my rock and he is my redeemer. And when something goes badly wrong, there is forgiveness with him and there is hope with him. And so today, as we just reflected on the way in which God speaks to us, God speaks to us through two books, speaks to us through the book of nature, speaks to us through the book of his word. Like, I wonder, how are you letting God speak to you? Whether you are taking the time to hear his voice, why not? And are you delighting in the reality that God is rock and redeemer for you? And whatever your pathway, if you're feeling like, I'm going into this week that I do not know what will happen, and I feel so insecure, ah, there is one who is strong. He is your rock. And there is one, if you have blown it all together, there is one who is your redeemer. And give thanks to God for that. Why don't we pray together? Oh Lord, we thank you that you are indeed rock and redeemer to us. And we pray that the words of our lips, the meditation of our hearts, would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, because you are a rock and redeemer to us. And help us to listen deeply to the two books that you've written. And thank you for them. Help us to heed their teaching, even in this week. Amen.
God, that is who you are. Oh, we give you all praise and glory this morning. Thank you for the reminder, if we needed it, of the majesty in the heavens, of the majesty of what you've created all around us, of the majesty of the community that you've put us in. Father, thank you for those things that reflect your glory, your beauty, your goodness. Help us to be more attuned to them. Holy Spirit, as you dwell in us, let us see those things more clearly as we go this week, that we might give you praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Well, bless you. What a great time together. We'll close our service now. But please stick around for some morning tea. Uh, the kids, if you've got kids in, uh, kids, carry kids, they'll be ready in about 10 minutes. So maybe grab your cup of tea first. Uh, and then uh, have a wonderful week. If you would like to come and learn a little bit more about Alpha, 11 o'clock uh, in the front here somewhere and we'll, uh, we'll talk together. But otherwise, let's go and love God, love each other, that we might be a flourishing community of hope. May God bless you this week.